King Alcinous and Odysseus go to the meeting grounds, as Athena whips up curiosity of the islanders to come and see the stranger who looks like a deathless god. King Alcinous, still not knowing the identity of his guest, calls for the Phaeacians to prepare a ship to take the stranger home, and he calls for a feast, a hero's welcome. As they feast, the bard sings the ballad of the strife between Odysseus and Achilles, a tale from Troy, and Odysseus quietly weeps, unnoticed by all save King Alcinous. King Alcinous then calls for games, and the young men gather to race, wrestle, box, and throw a discus. A man named Broadsea goads Odysseus into competing, and Odysseus, in his anger, throws a heavy discus farther than any of them. As a good host, King Alcinous de-escalates the situation and calls for the Phaeacians to dance. The bard returns and sings of the story of Aphrodite's adultery against Hephaestus. King Alcinous calls for parting gifts for Odysseus, and Broadsea gives the king of Ithaca a bronze sword and amends for his disrespect. Another feast is held, and Odysseus asks the bard to sing of the wooden horse at Troy. Odysseus again weeps quietly, and King Alcinous again notices. The book ends with the king finally asking Odysseus to reveal his name and his homeland. Welcome to Ascend the Great Books podcast. We're very happy to be here today to discuss book eight of the Odyssey, a day for songs and contests. You can check us out on social media, on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, on YouTube as well. Go visit our website, thegreatbookspodcast.com. There you can find a guide, a question and answer guide to the Odyssey. You can also find a whole library, actually, of articles and guides and et cetera to kind of help you through the great books. We're constantly adding to that library, so go and check it out. I'm very happy, again, to welcome Mr. Eli Stone to the podcast. Eli, it's good to have you, brother. Again, always a pleasure. Yeah, uh, I'm, sad we don't, I'm sad we don't have any other guests to join us. I know, uh, we should Adam probably... has been gone. Um, yeah. Yeah, we should talk about that. So poor Adam. Um, we still love Adam. He's still part of the podcast. He is, if you don't know, Adam Minahan, uh, not, in addition to being communications director for the Diocese of Tulsa, he also runs the Catholic Man Show, which is a podcast that's been up and running for, I don't know, seven, eight years. Very successful. And he goes around and does men's conferences. And so there's a lot of times that he's actually out. So actually, if you go to your local men's conference, he might be one of the speakers. Yeah, he's a popular guy. And so, you know, he's got better better things to do than talk about the great books with us, I suppose. He's good. Um, I am very happy that you can be here because I think you did a very good job of helping us navigate um, the relationship between Odysseus and Nausicaa in book six and book seven. So I'm very happy you can join us again to kind of round off this narrative in book eight. I certainly have some questions. You know, I want to understand the dancing better. I want to understand why Homer takes over 100 lines to introduce this myth of Hephaestus and Aphrodite. I think to the reader, that's a little jarring of why all of a sudden does he actually insert this whole myth in here? Uh, there's a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions about this. Yeah, I, also... I think there's, a, there's, there's some cool stuff going on here too, right? Uh, I mean, this is where you get to see the self-piloting ships and all of those fun things. Um, so yeah, it's a, great, it's a great chapter. And of course, we're transitioning into this dramatic point where Odysseus is a you know, he's asked to reveal his identity that he's been hiding so well this whole time. Um, so yeah, there's a lot in this book. It's it's kind of exciting to have the chance to talk about it with you. Yeah, I, I should say, so when I was a first-time reader, I really struggled with the text, the Odyssey, up to book five until we, we finally were kind of introduced to Odysseus. That's when we're introduced to him, right? Isn't that Calypso's Island is book five? Yeah. And then I still kind of struggled with the text because 
I was like, where are all the like mythical creatures and things that happen and et cetera. So I should say like, you know, I, I think you've done a very good job of helping us understand, I think a lot of the depth in the last couple of books. There's certainly things I have come to appreciate, but I should say that like, if you're somewhat a first time reader, you're struggling through the Odyssey, like does it get better? I guess that we're all the adventures and island hopping book nine and book 10 are, I think amongst amongst like the best literature in the great books tradition. I just think they're, um, they're amazing. There's the Cyclops, there's Circe, there's island hopping, and every island has some horrific thing that's going to happen. It's great, right? So it, it picks up the pace. The pace changes a lot. The content changes a lot. So if you're somewhat struggling with Odyssey this far, hang in there. I know this is about islands and dancing and King Alcinous is his daughter and like what's going on. After this, people start getting eaten by things. It's going to get better. Right. There's going to be some some more adventures if that's what you're craving. No, that's that's great. And I think it's interesting that you even say here. I think it's interesting that you even point out it gets more interesting there because this is when Odysseus starts telling his story. So uh, last couple of episodes, we've discussed this guest host relationship, um, which is a huge theme throughout the entire book is this hospitality what's expected of hosts, what's expected of guests. Uh, of course, this was a background uh, theme in the Iliad, where the whole plot of the Iliad begins with this terrible guest host relationship, namely Paris going to Menelaus's house and running off with his wife. Um, and here we see a lot of Odysseus on his travels uh, with various different types of guest host relationships. So we've seen a lot about what it means to be a good host or a bad host. But in this moving forward, uh, as we get into those fascinating stories, we get to see what it means to be a good guest, namely the, the reciprocity in a guest host relationship. If you're the host, you host someone, you feed them, you give them what they need to go on with their journey, all of those things. What does the guest offer in return? Well, oftentimes the guest offers entertainment, namely, tell us who you are. What is this great journey that you're on? What is your business? Tell us about news from foreign lands. Um, so this is what a guest can provide a host. And I think what you're saying, the Odyssey is about to get really great, is just a testament to how good of a guest Odysseus is by being able to tell all of these fantastic stories about uh, what happened to him since he's left Troy. Um, and the fact that we're still talking about it uh, 2,000 years, three, two, 3,000 years later, right? 2,800, depending on when you believe the Odyssey was actually long codified. Time. A, a long, long time ago. We're still talking about the way Odysseus tells his story. So I think that just speaks volumes to how great uh, Odysseus is as a rhetorician, a rhetorician, but also just as a guest. Because again, at the end of the day, he is fulfilling his end of the bargain in this guest host relationship. Yeah, we'll see. I, I like that. And let's hold on to that because I think that we'll see in the text, there's times that you see that he's really kind of like setting himself up. Like he hasn't revealed himself yet, but then he's like, oh, why don't you sing one of those songs uh, about Troy, right? Or why don't you sing the ballad about me, right? And so then he's like quietly weeping. So it, it's interesting because I think he's kind of baiting the king right into this right and i think that's kind of part of him being uh, a guest so it'll be interesting to kind of play play that out of odysseus as the guest whether he's a good guest or not um i have no segue completely unrelated though before we get into uh, book eight unless it's just like general adventure i'm just excited actually i'm going on a bear hunt oh you are okay i am i'm going on my wife is an amazing wife and uh, she got me this as a gift. And so I've been, you know, hunting whitetails for a while. And we do the whole, at the house, you know, we do the whole nine yards, if you will. So, like, I'll go out in the morning and, you know, sit out in the woods. Hopefully, you know, with the divine favor, a deer comes out at, like, 830. And we do the whole the whole thing. So I'll go out there, you know, shoot the deer, field dress the deer, bring the deer back to the house, and then uh, butchering it is actually a family experience. And so we, I butcher it outside. I need to be able to hang it. I haven't been able to hang it yet, so I butcher it on the ground, which I, I, talking to other hunters, I think I'm 
still like in the barbaric stage of things. I need to, you know, hang it and make my life easier. But I butcher it and then I carry it into the house, you know, in quarters. And like literally all of our kids have like a roll, like one's picking the hair off. Cause you know the thing about deer hair, as soon as you cut into the hide, the hair just starts like falling off like this. So you got one little kid's picking out the hair. The other one, my boy likes to sit on the counter and like push the thing through the meat grinder, right? He's just like shoving the meat like through there. They all have their little rolls. So it's become like a, a very family affair for us. And it's, it's something I've greatly enjoyed because it's very real. Because yeah, then, it's like far, farm to table kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, it's very much field to table in a single day because we will, um, you know, if I'm blessed like that and we have a deer that comes out, and that happened a couple of times last season. And uh, what that means is that I can get back home with the deer, butcher it all, and we can have either the tenderloins or the back straps for dinner that night. Right. We just leave those out and we have like a little feast. The tenderloins and the, the deer are typically pretty small. So it's usually tenderloins and the back straps. And so, yeah, the kids see that like entire process. And it's really been a it's really been a good introduction to just a certain level of realism. Like, where does your food come from? What has to happen for you to have meat or to have a burger or to have a brisket? Right. Like what actually has to happen for this food to show up on your table? And my kids have become so habituated to it that they assume all meat that we eat. Uh, dad killed right Where oh that's the- great yeah he killed it it's not the it's not the opposite problem where they're like oh all of all meat comes from the store it's like no dad dad went and like slaughtered everything that <laughs> yeah the dad killed everything where's this meat come dad dad killed it um which is good you know it's that's true for most of our meat we got i think I, I had three deer last year and so you know we have a couple freezers uh to fill it up and then we got um and then we get we have a cow uh, I think we got half a cow last year that we have from a friend who has a ranch up in North Oklahoma and we go in and, you know, get half a cow and kind of stack the freezer. So it's, it's, um, it's become very much a family affair. And so my wife bought me this bear hunt uh, over in the Ozarks. So I'm going to go over there and it, it should be fun. It's at like a little ranch and um, it's a little bougie. They take care of you for a few days and there's meals and things like this. And then the Ozarks have done over in Arkansas, they've done a ton of work to rehabilitate their black or yeah, their black bear population. And some of those are coming into Oklahoma, not, you know, some, not all, but their numbers over there are pretty good. And so I originally decided to go over there because um, of a rifle season, like in Arkansas, you can use a rifle, which seems prudent if you're going to go in the woods and try to shoot a bear, you use a rifle as opposed to black powder um, because, you know, you've got your one shot and that's it. And then also uh, a bow. And I had never shot a bow before. And that also seemed somewhat problematic to go in the woods after a black bear with a bow. So I went over to Arkansas and got it all scheduled out. You want to talk primitive. That's (laughs) Yeah. So I got it all scheduled out. And then after we did that, we found out that uh, the guy who I scheduled it with called me and told me that given the dates I was coming and how they do their system where it is rifle season, but there's only a certain amount of tags that the state gives. And so even though it's still rifle season, the tags might be out. He was like, oh yeah, when you come out, you can't bring a rifle. It'll all be over. So you need to bring a bow. And I was like, oh boy. Okay, great. So yours truly has been learning how to, I went out and bought a crossbow. And so I've been practicing out on the land. I even had a a buddy of mine that's an archery expert come over and kind of help me zero it in because the crossbow has a scope. The shooting mechanisms are very much similar to a rifle. Just how you control your breath, you know, a, a gentle trigger pull, not knowing when it's going to go off, things like that. The mechanics of shooting it are very similar, but uh, other than that, it's completely different. Like trying to actually like pull it up and cock the crossbow and the arrow, and it fires at like over 400 feet per second. Like I, after watching this whole thing, I would much rather get shot by a rifle. Like I, would, like personally, if I did take a choice, I would much rather get shot by a rifle than this arrow that's going 400 feet per second and then basically has razor blades on the front. Oh yeah, that's, yeah that doesn't sound brutal. particularly pleasant. Do <clears throat> yeah, well, you'll have to pray to the deathless gods, uh, Artemis, and you know, keep us updated. That sounds like quite a trophy if you can snag one too. Are you gonna make yeah, a, so like a rug podcast, out of it or something? Yeah, when this podcast randomly comes to an end here in like oh, two yeah. weeks, <laughs> it's because Adam's the- Adam's gonna come back and be like, uh, well, you know. Yeah, our host I'm was eaten back, by a but... bear. <laughs> yeah, sorry, the the podcast is over because the the host got eaten. Yeah, by don't. A bear. Don't run into Artemis. Uh, pray you don't encounter Artemis and chance upon her naked or anything, because that'll be bad. 
pray to uh, Athena and whoever else you got. And uh, yeah, we'll go. <laughs> Godspeed. <laughs> Yeah, I guarantee you that if I'm out in the woods and I look up and see a naked woman, I will get out of there for many, many different reasons. <laughs> anyway, that's my that's my sidetrack on um, bear hunting. So I will keep the podcast updated on how that goes. All right, book eight. So we are a day of songs and contests. We are still dealing with Odysseus on the island under King Alcinous's hospitality. So let's kind of get into this. All right. So if you look at book eight, let's see, where would be a good place to start? Oh, one thing I like just here at the beginning. So we're kind of going back into this hospitality. We're seeing like King Alcinous is saying, you know, I'll take you home. And they're, he's calling his people together. And they have this big meeting, come see the stranger. Athena's kind of whipping them up. They have this interest. I think it's interesting on line 40, you know, he says, come, my people, haul a black ship down to the bright sea, rigged for her maiden voyage, enlist a crew of 52 young sailors, the best in town, who've proved their strength before. So, I mean, how I read that is, it's like, this is not just a, um, you know, this is not just, we're just going to take you home. And I'm pretty sure we still don't even know where home is, right? This is still just this, this guest friendship of like, listen, we'll take you home, stranger. But also there seems to be this extra mile. That listen, we'll we'll take a ship that's in her maiden voyage. We'll take our best sailors to take you home. Right? This is this extra. This guest friendship is getting very thick, right? And it's hospitality. Yeah. No, I I think you're correct. I mean, this is, and I think this goes back to, uh, one. It's been so long since they've had guests, and I think what we were tracking last time is it seems like Alcinous doesn't have or didn't have the you know, it's like, oh, how do we how do we do this, right? Um, so he initially doesn't jump on providing the hospitality until one of the older uh, lords is able to like say, hey, do, does anybody remember how to do this kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Um, but now it's coming out in spades. It's and, and maybe part of it is in atonement for like the the faux pas of not offering it immediately. But I think you're you're also seeing that these 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 people have a tremendous amount of wealth and they don't have any strangers to spoil it on. Um, Not very many anyhow. And so Mm -hmm. it's been so long since they've had a guest that they're very eager at the chance to provide this hospitality. But as you said, they don't know where home is uh, and yet they're giving him a ship that is brand new um, and they're going to uh, provide him as we'll see with excellent hospitality during his stay on the Island I agree. I think we talked about that last time that I think that once you kind of get past that faux pas in the beginning and allowing your guests to go wallow in the ashes over by the hearth, once we made it past that point, this is probably one of the best examples of guest friendship that we have, like in the Homeric texts, not just because of like the lavishness, but this also to like the trip home, the games, just everything they do for him. I think it's just like a phenomenal example. It's, it's kind of on par, I think with Nestor, and Menelaus welcoming Telemachus. But maybe to kind of lean into your point earlier, Telemachus can only be so good of a guest, right? He's he's coming in search of his father. Like he's kind of learning. There's a maturation on his part. He's learning how to talk to these kings, how to ask for things. You know, we're seeing that. Whereas Odysseus can come in and be this great rhetorician and tell these great stories and kind of have that reciprocity that I think you opened up with, which I think is very important. Let's look at... um. Let's look at like line 71 or so. I love this. So the other motif that we've been tracking are bards. We don't see a lot of bards in the Iliad. I don't actually recall if I remember really any. And then all of a sudden in the Odyssey, they're everywhere, right? And there's certain certain mechanics for this. And this one we see in book eight, the bard allows for other stories to be inserted into the narrative. Like, so I think they have uh, a certain mechanical function inside the epic. But this one, book eight, I thought, laid it on a bit much at times because let's look at this so 71 in came the herald now or the bard uh or no the is the herald leading along the faithful bard the muse adored above all others true but her gifts were mixed with good and evil both she stripped him of his sight but gave the man the power of stirring rapturous song so obviously what i find comical about this for those who don't know is that, you know, legend has it that Homer, right, is blind. And so here comes this, uh, you know, bard 
that is saying, oh, the muse, right? This one, the muse adores above all others. And yeah, he's blind. She stripped him of sight. But, you know, the power of stirring rapturous song, right? Imagine like Homer being the one that actually repeats this while he's blind over in the corner, right? I mean, this is just, it's, I think it's comical. No, I think, I think tracking bards is interesting because, uh, so if you take, so there's a theory that uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, so they're both 24 books long, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and so they're about the same length. So there's a theory that um, these epics would have been, you know, spoken or, or sang over the course of a day. Uh, and actually over the course of three days because of how long they are. And so if you've got three days of partying laid out and you're, you know, hey, we're, let's do the Lord of the Rings marathon. Let's do the the, mm -hmm. the marathon of the Odyssey. Uh, so you get all of your guests together and everything. You have your bard come in. Well, your bard is going to be having to break this text up over three days. And notice that if you divide 24 by three, you get eight. So there's a theory that after book eight is kind of where the bard would stop for the day. And so it's interesting, perhaps not coincidental, that a bard features very prominently in book eight. We might also want to track and see, okay, like book 16, 17, is there another mm. bard? Um, and yeah, that this is right before uh, whoever was performing this song would have had the opportunity to ask for tips or things like that um so i think i think you're right i think homer is trying to remember remind everyone uh how great a good bard is um you know here before before his conclusion of the first night of this song but i do think it's i do think it's interesting uh an interesting theory which is really funny right because we'll see that in book eight that there basically is a tip given to the bard Right. There is this like gift. And if you put it in that context, it's even more funny. Right. About what the like this guy's performing and being like, you know, remember your bard. Remember, you know, we're touched by the muses. How amazing this is. Yeah, it's it's a very human element to it that I, I find to be fascinating. So uh, if there's nothing else, let's look at like 89 or so. So this is the first. So we have the bard and the bard is going to sing these little epics. Now, one of the things is about the Iliad and the Odyssey is that we know that there were also other epics that were also sung, right? Part of this overall narrative. And I think, you know, we can point out here that this one that's sung, the strife between Odysseus and Achilles. Now, if you read the Iliad with us, I think that this strikes you a little bit odd because you might be saying, well, what, what strife was there between Odysseus and Achilles? I don't remember that in the Iliad. And that's because it's not an Iliad story. And so maybe we should just take a moment, and maybe like, you know, parse out how this works. Because I think it comes up later in the text too. There's a relationship um, that you need to really understand what happened between, not maybe what happened, but like the tension between Odysseus and Achilles. So just on a high level, the way that I understand it as part of one of these interim stories is that basically when you get the end of the Iliad, you get the death of Hector which I think is a beautiful ending and, and brings up, as we've discussed in the podcast, a lot of questions about Homer's intent in the Iliad story, that it ends with the death of Hector. Well, still you have the fall of Troy. And if you remember, we have a whole podcast episode on that interim period. Because what you think is Hector dies, Troy falls. But that's really not true at all, right? There's all these little narratives that come up. If I remember a whole other army from Ethiopia or somewhere comes up to like reinforce Troy and there's like this whole other battle and that's Achilles' last battle. But basically, if we kind of boil it down to the tension between Odysseus and Achilles is that Achilles like is, represents kind of this primal force, right? This violence, this skill set in war. And Odysseus represents um, this craftiness, right? This this cunning. And eventually what we find out is, is that Achilles can't bring Troy down. Like he just can't do it. This brute strength, this prowess in combat cannot bring Troy down. Meanwhile, who does bring Troy down? And who in the interim period, I remember even when we did that episode, over and over again, there's a problem, 
and Odysseus solves it. There's a problem, and Odysseus solves it. There's a problem, and Odysseus solves it, right? Until he eventually solves the problem of how do we take down Troy? We're going to take it down with the, you know, the, the famous Trojan horse, the wooden horse narrative. And by the time you get to that, Achilles is dead, right? He's dead. It's his son, actually, who has come to the war where they've been there for 20 years. It's his son, actually, who's in the wooden horse. And so what you see then in this interim period, the strife between Odysseus and Achilles, is that you get Odysseus as this like mastermind, cunning craftiness, and Achilles as this kind of like primal, you know, violent uh, military prowess. And there's a strife then there that it starts to occur about, you know, who actually is the greatest and who actually can bring down Troy. And the answer is Odysseus. No, I think that's correct. And um, this is actually reinforced in another one of those in-between narratives that you mentioned. So after the death of Achilles at Troy, um, the Achaeans have to vote um, how to apportion Achilles' armor, right? Who are they going to give Achilles' armor to? Who is going to succeed Achilles as the, quote-unquote, the best of the Achaeans? Um, So if you were going to say um, it was this raw military brute force Um, If the Achaeans were going to say this is what is going to win us through this battle, um, the choice is not Odysseus. It's actually supposed to be Ajax. So Ajax is second only to Achilles in the Iliad, and that's referenced several times. It's also referenced in one of these in-between stories, right? So there is a debate. Should we give this armor to Ajax or should we give this armor to Odysseus? And I can't remember exactly how it's decided. I think they draw a lot or they, they, everyone casts their vote and like, you know, by secret ballot, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the arm, the, the army overwhelmingly chooses Odysseus and Ajax takes this as an affront to his armor. And actually he, he commits suicide. He kills himself um, over this kind of slight on his honor as a warrior that they would give Odysseus the armor of Achilles even though Ajax is the superior military fighter to Odysseus. But I think this shows that you have a shift in the Iliad or or after the Iliad leading into the Odyssey, what's being valued more as a society, not just raw violence, but actually some element of intelligence or rhetoric or the ability to scheme and kind of plan this is what eventually brings down troy and this is ultimately uh going to stand for civilization as a whole we don't need violence as much because we are cultivated we are civilized we have a justice system in place um and we can be a flourishing society of peace much like the phaeacians are here um so i think yeah you're you're right to draw out a lot of these items here um, that there is this tension between uh, the raw militaristic power or the fighting, uh, the thumos, you could say, the fighting spirit uh, versus the crafty spirit or this Odyssean character, the man of twists and turns. Um, and I think it represents a shift in or or an evolution of thought about what it means to be human, right? And what is what does power actually look like? Is it reducible solely to physical strength or are there other forms of power? Are there other forms of excellence or virtue? Um, and I think we see in some of those in-between narratives a shift from an idea of virtue as purely being about strength or physical prowess um, and the ability to just dominate one's enemies to being something more, something more comprehensive, something more intellectual, something more persuasive rather than coercive. Yeah, we usually talk about uh, the contrast there, the foil is actually between Achilles and Hector. And on the podcast a lot, we talked a lot about, you know, is Homer the teacher doing something there with what is arete? What does it mean to be an excellent human? And there's a lot of contrasting between Achilles and his selfishness and allowing, you know, praying that his countrymen die so they learn a lesson versus, you know, Hector's, um, you know, famous episode of going back to his family 
and you kind of see him in that that book uh, very clearly being pious towards the gods, being pious towards the polis of Troy, and being pious towards his family, right, and having this kind of threefold piety. It's interesting. So do you think that that, that Arate comparison also then between Achilles and Hector then can also be made between Achilles and Odysseus? Because I don't find him, I, I can see it in certain ways, because I think the Odyssey takes up a much heavier understanding of anthropology and what it means to be human, because I think our agency, right, the free will is much greater, I think, in the Odyssey than it is in the Iliad. But it's harder for me, and I'm probably playing too many cards here, but it's harder for me to track Odysseus as a contrast in Arete to Achilles than it is, like, say, Hector. Yeah, I don't think there's a perfect contrast to be made. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say, like, we should be contrasting Odysseus and Achilles so starkly. I mean, Odysseus is also a warrior, right? So he did go and fight in Troy. Like he is still using violent means uh, to to attain the ends that he's seeking after. And we'll see that as he describes his journeys, right? As he begins to tell his story, um, he's not a, you know, we don't want to make him out to be something he's not. He's still very much embedded in this um, culture that, uh, is still very, in many ways, brutal, barbaric, uh, maybe by modern standards. But he he is still, I think, an emblem of a growing shift in Greek society, a shift away from a purely um, tribalistic sort of violent means of securing one's one's goals, and moving more towards this civilization where. And perhaps it would be better to put it this way. I think that the Odyssey represents peacetime. Like, what are the values of a culture and a civilization in peacetime rather than in war? So mm-hmm. what's interesting is we what what is the value of honor in war well it's that it's going to last after your death right this is the eternal life that achilles like seeks it's not his own life it's actually like he doesn't seek immortality in the sense that he is going to live forever he's going to find immortality in undying glory right this kleos but what's interesting is that for odysseus Glory is a means to his homecoming. And as we'll see in this chapter, he's actually very, this book here rather, he's very concerned about his honor and his kleos and what people are saying about him, precisely because it will help him reach his end of getting home. And without that glory, without that kleos, he's not going to be able to get home. So maybe it's not such a stark contrast between Odysseus and Achilles because one is superior to the other or society is evolving in a direction. But I I would argue it is probably that. I would say that the Iliad is probably compositionally older than the the Odyssey is. But I also think that this represents a dichotomy or a transition from wartime to peacetime. What is valuable in war versus what is valuable in peace? How do you motivate yourself to get through the terrible things of war? You're going to have undying glory. That's what you got. That's you got to you got to or that your children are going to live on and sing the songs of uh, how you did at Troy versus for Odysseus. His glory is going to be the thing that helps him get home. So I think that's these are some of the contrasts that are evoked. I don't think it's necessarily about Achilles versus Odysseus versus is a better contrast than Odysseus versus Hector, but I still think there are plenty of contrasts or or foils to be made there. Yeah, it's a different contrast, right? And so I because I find Odysseus to actually be a much more conflicted and complex character than Hector is. And so I think he does contrast with Achilles in a certain way that kind of cleverness versus maybe that that kind of more brutish power and military prowess. But I don't, It's it would be hard for me to track into Odysseus being Homer's, you know, example of arete, of human excellence. I think there's aspects of that, like his journey home. I like what you say, that his glory is a means to the end. 
but then also then he receives great glory at the end because he made it home, right? So it's kind of a both and scenario. So it's interesting just because, you know, if you just read the Iliad and it kind of drops this tension between Odysseus and Achilles, you don't really have a whole lot of context for what they're talking about. But it, this is part of that interim period. And I think you really are seeing what finally brought down Troy. It was cleverness. It was wisdom, right? It was that craft as opposed to the rage. The rage did not bring down Troy. The, you know, the wooden horse did. So good. I think that's a good comparison to draw out. Let's look at, okay, so Eli, I'm going to need you to give me maybe a little bit of a defense of Homer here because we're having this, uh, so we have the feasts. He cries, he weeps. Only King Alcinous uh, sees him. And then we're going to have some games, correct? So this is great. So we haven't seen games like this in a while. I don't think we, have we seen games like this since the funeral games of Patroclus? I don't know if we have. Have we? Uh, I don't think we have. No, there has there haven't been any games mentioned since Patroclus's death games, and I'm unsure. I would imagine there's probably some games that occur after the fall of Troy in one of those interim stories. Mm-hmm. Um, I am not familiar with a narrative that has any particular significance to that this would echo or anything like that. So, but I so I think for we can just think that yes, this is. These are probably the first games that we've seen yeah. since yeah, the fall in the, of Troy. Uh, in the Homeric, you know, texts, right? This is the first time we've seen this, and we talked about this when we talked about the death of Patroclus. That this is also the culture that eventually gives rise to the Olympics, right? right. This kind of this games, this competitive spirit, which in really is in a lot of ways is a training for war. It's a training uh, of your thumos to be spirited. Right, just like you said, you you seek glory in war. Well, this is kind of a training, a practice, a somewhat artificial structure of that to be able to get glory in the foot race. Get glory, you know, what do we see here? We have a foot race, some wrestling, some jumping, some discus throwing, etc. But what I I might need a little bit of help with here, Eli, if you have a great answer, is these names. Like these names of the people are almost hilarious. Like if someone came to me and they're like, hey, I'm writing a book. Oh yeah, what's it about? Well, it's about a you know, a seafaring people that live on an island. Oh, great, that sounds fascinating. What are their names? Do you have some names up? Yeah, man, I've got great names. Uh like Rohard and Seaman and Stern Man and Surf at the Beach, Stroke or Bow Spirit, Racing the Wind, Swing Aboard, Sea Girt, and Broad Sea. I'm like, yeah, that this is the book what? This is like an adolescent this is like the seventh grade fantasy novel. Like what do we know what's going on with these names at all? I mean outside yeah. kind of comical. Uh, no, I think it's somewhat comical, but I think um I think these names are are just and I think what Fagels is getting at with these is that these names are kind of throwaways. Like they're not meant to be like they're nobody significant, right? Like there's not there, there's no one in this list that's that has any relevance outside of the Odyssean narrative, I guess you could say. Um, so I, I think it's um, I think it's just meant to reflect, right? This is a seafaring people, and this is like part of their culture. Uh, but I also do think it's it's just kind of a who's who of nobody in particular. Um, so I think that this is what. Uh, maybe Fagels is trying to draw out with this particular translation of these names, which I'm uh, actually, I mean, if you know, right, Odysseus's name is actually a pun on the word for pain, right? So, Mm -hmm. or suffering. And so there's, um, I think this is common in ancient, in ancient cultures in general, names are very uh, direct, like they, they, they are common words that you would also have in the same language. Like in English, we have names like autumn, right? Um, so you would, I think to an ancient culture, this they wouldn't necessarily sniff at these names as much. Um, but I think in the purpose of this narrative, they're also not meant to be particularly interesting names, I guess you could say. I just like the guy named Rohard. Row hard, yeah. Like he's like he's rowing real hard, I'm sure, right? Living up to like that, that name. So they have their so they have these games, uh, which I, I think is fascinating. I mean, just as like on a fraternal aspect, right? Just to have these games, you feast. We're gonna stand up or have games and prizes and things of this nature. And so, of course, they're looking over at their guest Odysseus, 
And, you know, he looks like a warrior, right? He's got, you know, thick thighs and legs and a broad neck, right? He should be able to actually participate. And then we get, um, you know, eventually what ends up goading him uh, into actually, Odysseus, you know, into actually participating is Broadsea, right? One of these characters basically, you know, has this this critique of him. Where well, he's like, oh. I, I want to correct you here, actually. So if you look at 150, mm-hmm. you have, or 151, the king's good son, Laodamas, bo- uh, boxed them to their knees. When he had, when all had enjoyed the games to their heart's content, Alcinus's son, Laodamas, spurred them, come, my friends, let's ask our guest if he knows the ropes of any sport. Then, after like one at 162, Broadsea then puts in, well said, right to the point, go up to the fellow and challenge him yourself. So actually, this is Alcinus's son who is challenging Odysseus to join in these games. It's not Broadsea. Broadsea is just this side character, uh, which is why I think it's important to bear in mind that these are just kind of throwaway names, right? But Laodamas, the one who challenges Odysseus, he is named with uh, something that's a little weightier. So actually, Odysseus's host's son is the one who's picking on him here in this. So that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't I didn't read it like that um, because so how do you take it with? um, Yeah, I agree that obviously, like the king's son is the one that invites him to do this. I -hmm. don't. I don't see him being disrespectful, though. Odysseus basically declines, and then it's Broadsea that gets under his skin. Right? Okay, no, I see. I see what you're saying. So you're so the challenge is initiated by Alcinous' son, but you're pointing out that mm-hmm. Broadsea cuts in and makes fun of Odysseus or mocks him as a as a consequence of his rejection right, of the I, offer, which I took to be what precipitated him to even do anything. Right, because he basically it's Broad Sea that comes in and you know has this kind of funny uh, critique, right? That basically, oh, you look like a you know you're not actually you know an athlete. You're you're a merchant, right? You're just some merchant, right? You can't actually do anything because it's Odysseus here. Yeah, yeah, my read of this was that it's Broad Sea that precipitates. He goads, and then later on, it's Broad Sea then that has to make amends for right. I guess being rude to a guest. Well, I do think it's interesting. You brought out there's a connection here between athletics and war. So actually, this is another example of rhetoric. You kind of have to read between between the lines a little bit by saying, well, you don't look like an athlete to me. You must be a merchant. What he's telling Odysseus is that, like, you're not a warrior. Like, you haven't seen war, even though he's been dropping hints that, like, he seems Mm -hmm. like he should be, like he's talked about how you know i i went and fought this war and like i'm i'm you know i i've had all of these woes and so he's basically calling odysseus a liar and saying oh well, you're you're not an athlete you must be a merchant and so what he's really saying is you're not a warrior um yeah i, and, you know, I, I totally agree with you uh, because you know the athletics being kind of like the the training for war i mean i took someone calling him a merchant to be like one step up from someone calling him a woman Right. Oh, yeah. Like you can fight. You're just this soft merchant. You know, I knew it. And he does. He gets him under his skin. And so this is really so this is one of those things when I read and maybe I'd like to contrast this maybe with something you said earlier. So I was a little surprised, particularly the first time I read this, that I mean, this is Odysseus. Like, brother, you have been through hell at this point. Right. And we're not even sure, like for first time readers, we're not even sure all the hell that you've been through. But we know you went through Troy. We know you were on Calypso's Island. Like, you want to get home. And this guy, some young buck, can get under your skin like this bad with basically one little paragraph. Because, I mean, Odysseus just goes off. I mean, we've got lines and lines and lines and, like, critiquing Broadsea back. You know, he ends it with, you know, your insults cut to the quick. You rouse my fighting blood. And, of that course, Thumas, we- that, 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 like, fighting spirit. Um, yeah. I I really like Odysseus's like just zinger here, right? Like at 190, 192, he says, "You, you're a reckless fool. I see that much. So the gods don't hand out all their gifts at once. 
not build and brains and flowing speech to all. So, yeah, it's just, you know, this quick wittedness of Odysseus. But like you said, he really, he really gets under Odysseus's skin. Um, but you think, and let me read between the lines of what you're drawing out here. You think that this is inappropriate for Odysseus or like that this is somehow Odysseus slipping up. Like, is that, well, push that out for me. Yeah. I mean, maybe to, to take maybe a step, a step back, um, maybe to look at a big picture and then we go back and look at some of the details because the way I read this and how it kind of impressed upon me was that Bronze gets under his skin. I think Odysseus has somewhat of a disproportionate reaction to this, particularly for a guy who's been through so much. Now you could flip that and say, yeah, he's been through so much and he's ready to get home and he's he's at, you know, breaking point. You could you could flip that as a two-edged sword. But what I read it as is like so you kind of skip we'll skip a few details. But then King Alcinous when he jumps in, which is a little bit for like 270 like I found him to being a very gracious host, and this is how I kind of somewhat contextualized it in the narrative, that he he kind of does two things. I think he somewhat runs interference for Odysseus, but then I think he also somewhat critiques him. And so, you know, so he said, I mean, we'll just read it. So he says, you know, stranger friend, nothing you say among us seems ungracious. So that's him. That's him. I think that's a cover, right? Well, you did just insult a bunch of people and went on a rant and et cetera. But so I think that's a cover. You simply want to display the gifts you're born with. Stung that a youngster marched up to you in the games, mocking, ridiculing, and prowess at, yeah, you know, as no one would. And I, that one I take a little bit as a critique, right? Like, hey, yeah, you let the youngster sting you, right? Which I don't, you know, I think a great man of Thumos probably should not allow to happen. And so that's how, I mean, I'm open to other reads. That's kind of how I saw the movement of this text. There's a couple of things here we need to look at, I think, in the middle and get back and, you know, step back from uh, the forest and get back into the trees here. But I think if I can contrast it with something you said earlier, my question here would be, if we follow that train of thought, is Odysseus being a good guest here? Right? Is he actually being a good guest? And does King Alcinous kind of gently kind of push him back to where he needs to be? Yeah, I think that's a good I think that's a good question. So to to give a more broad overview, because you kind of jumped ahead to King Alcinous's contribution. So he says, you know, I'll compete in your game. Just watch your insults cut to the quick. You rouse my fighting blood. So Odysseus gets up. He grabs a discus that is larger than all of the other discuses that have been thrown or dis dis key. I, I don't know how that works in plural. Just go for it. But he he grabs one that's larger and heavier than any that have been thrown, and he throws it, and he throws it farther than anyone else's uh, thrown it. Um, there's also this mention of Queen Athena. So Athena is uh, kind of as Adam pointed out last time or two times ago that he's like buttering him buttering him up or making him look really good. Um, so she helps him here, and so he throws this discus really far and then we, Odysseus takes a moment to kind of sit and gloat over his achievement here um so here in 230 at that the heart of the long suffering hero laughed so glad to find a ready friend in the crowd that lighter in mood he challenged all Phaeacia's best now go match that you young pups and straight away, I'll hurl it another just as far, I swear, or even farther. And he goes on and on. But then he says this. You know, he basically says, you know, he, he'll, he'll challenge them in anything else. He says, you know, I think the only thing he, sa- he points out is that I wouldn't be good at, I wouldn't be good at uh, running. He says, like, I think you guys have beat me there in the footwork. But here around 245, he says, I'll take on all contenders gladly and test them head to head. I'm no disgrace in the world of games where men compete. Well, I know how to handle a fine polished bow. The first to hit my man in a mass of enemies, even with rows of comrades pressing near, taking aim with our shafts to hit our targets. Philoctetes alone outshot me there at Troy when ranks of Achaean archers bent their bows. 
Of the rest, I'd say I'd outclass them all, men still alive who eat their bread on earth. So what's fascinating to me is that this whole time Odysseus has been very, very quiet about who he is. When the bard was singing about the strife between Odysseus and Achilles, he's weeping. Obviously, this is drawing up his memories. This is obviously a song about him. But he's trying to show no emotion. He's weeping, but he hides himself so that no one can know that he must be related or somehow involved with this strife between Odysseus and Achilles at Troy. Um, he doesn't volunteer to tell them, I'm Odysseus, I'm an Achaean, I'm this person. Remember last time we learned that the Phaeacians are very closely related to Poseidon. And so it makes sense that Odysseus is hesitant to inform them of who he is because he's afraid that these people who are descended and allied, presumably with Poseidon, would not give him hospitality if he told them that, hey, I'm the guy that Poseidon hates, right? But here, this youngster gets under his skin, like you said, and whether because he just gets angry and kind of swings and starts blurting things out, just kind of seeing red, boasting, whether he feels like this is an insult to his honor that he needs to reclaim, like his kleos, his glory, um, or maybe this is just pride. Maybe Odysseus can't bear the thought that someone doesn't know who he is. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something we'll need to keep track of because this isn't the only time that Odysseus will slip up and give away his identity. Now, no one here calls him on it. Alcinus, like, very graciously, like, de-escalates the situation, doesn't comment, oh, by the way, you said you're at Troy. Hmm, I think I know who, I think I remember hearing the song about Philoctetes being uh, the one, and I think they said who was the one who outshot Philoctetes, or who Philoctetes outshot, right? Like, if he knew the story of Troy, which we know these people know, they would know who he is. Odysseus just gave them his identity inadvertently and I think unintentionally. So I think you're right. I think this is a slip up in Odysseus's um, role as a guest. I think this is actually not just a social faux pas, though. This is actually contrary to Odysseus's own intentions with how am I going to strategically make sure that this is safe enough a place for me to reveal my identity to um, especially if we believe he's trying to build to this great reveal of who he is, I think he's just undermined it because he just let the cat out of the bag too early. This isn't theatric. This isn't a theatrical way at all to say, "Oh, by the way, I'm this great legendary hero, and you should really uh, speed me on my way because that will bring your people this great glory to have aided such a great hero in his homecoming." Um, he doesn't do any of that. He's kind of just lost everything. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think this is a faux pas. I think Odysseus, is miss Odysseus misses here, um, not just on the hospitality end, but I think he actually contravenes some of his own aims mm. uh, in navigating the Phaeacian society here. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that I mean that's that's how I read it as well. I'm sure others could read it as you know this is some strategic hint that that he kind of gives but i i think in the context of him losing his anger right of losing his patience if you will uh this young man broad sea getting underneath his skin it does read more to me as a slip right as he's bragging and in his you know being braggadocious he accidentally gives an aspect of who he is away prior to what he wants to do. I think we should hold on to that because I, I'm, I'm kind of interested to compare that to a few other things he does later in the text um, to, as we kind of parse out his intention. But no, I, I think that's that's my read as well. And that's why I see the king coming in and I think being a very gracious host and covering for him while also somewhat pointing out that he got stung by a youngster and met, you know, I'm not really sure the war hero from Troy uh, should have let this happen as far. Let's look down at uh, around 280 or so. So we're getting away from the games, and he's like, listen, you know, we're we're not world-class boxers or wrestlers, because, by the way, we have athletics, which trains you for war, but we also don't have anyone to war against, because we're basically a utopia. 
And so, you know, we're master sailors. Well, <clears throat> you can't really show your sailing here at the war games, right? So we're going to dance, right? We're the masters of dance, which I think this found this this lands somewhat comical uh, to us, right? But there's a few things that I would note about it. One, I think it's pretty quick that you can notice that their dancing is something more akin to gymnastics, right? It's this it's this display of athletic uh, prowess, right? Let's see, you know, how good we are. I also think I'd like to throw this out that last time we kind of discussed the thesis that Phaeacia is very similar to the city of peace on Achilles' shield. And so here, you know, we're saying, listen, we're not at war. We don't have these things, but we know how to dance, which strikes me very much as a peaceful aspect, right? Something you do in a culture when you're at peace. It's still athletic, right? I think it still has some of that reminiscent of being part of those things that would train you for war, but it seems much more akin to a society that is habituated to peace. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is these are they mention, right? They're they're throwing balls back and forth, right, uh to each other in this narrative or it's bookended uh to book in this narrative, but um this brings us back to what Nausicaa and her maidens were doing, right? They were playing with a ball while they were waiting for the clothes to dry. They are probably also engaging in these gymnastics. Hmm. Um and I think I think you're right. I think this gives us in a clue into um the fact that this this society is a very peaceful society. Um and it lends itself to this utopia. It's interesting. Um here just above 300 it says odysseus gazed at their flying flashing feet his heart aglow with wonder so presumably they have an excellence here that odysseus hasn't even seen before and so i think in that sense this if we're tracking this as a temptation for odysseus to stay in this utopia instead of going on to ithaca um, he has never seen anything like this he's never known a society that could cultivate such uh such excellent such um finely tuned gymnastic arts that you know these these youngsters can all demonstrate so well so i think this is meant to to really highlight what you're saying which is that there's a piece that odysseus has never known and probably will never know apart from staying on this island right yeah, I think that's a good thing to to recall and to track that we're also looking at this island as a temptation to Odysseus, primarily through the means of Nausicaa, right? The young princess who's both clever and beautiful and reminiscent of a young Penelope and happens to live in this utopia. If Odysseus decides to marry her, which we've already seen that offer be made, you know, he'd be grafted into you know, these descendants of the gods of Poseidon. So no, I think that's a good thing to continue the track and kind of see how he responds to different aspects of the island and, and whether or not that really is still a temptation for him to stay. Let's move to 300 and let's take on this myth, this very extended myth, over 100 lines that we get from Homer on the love of Ares and Aphrodite crowned with flowers. So let me kind of set this up and then ask you, why do we think Homer spends so much time? Because typically he doesn't do this, right? This is not his style. He typically references some mythology, and most of us have to go look it up, right? We've talked about on the podcast before, um, you know, a good a good guide to Greek mythology is um, Edith Hamilton's uh, encyclopedia on mythology, right? That's the one that I use. And a lot of times you just get like one line, two lines, you know, Heracles did this, or you know, sometimes it's very subtle. Like um, when we talk about Odysseus on the island of Calypso, it opens up with Don's husband, Tithonus, and then says nothing about him. When actually we realize that his narrative is incredibly central to understanding Odysseus's uh, declining of Calypso's offer of immortality. Well, Here, what's interesting, what's interesting too, is even earlier in this book, right? The last song that the bard sung was the strife between Odysseus and Achilles. And it doesn't, it doesn't, specify like it doesn't go into depth there mm -hmm. but here there is a lot of depth 
There is. So let's let me maybe set up the narrative, and then I'd like to ask you why we think this is here. So one is is that okay? So we start off. It's it's uh, you know Aries, Aphrodite. One thing we should notice is Aphrodite here is married to Hephaestus, and this is a distinction in the mythology. In the Iliad, Hephaestus was married to one of the Graces. Here in the Odyssey, he is married to uh, Aphrodite. And it, pretty much now, if you ever look up who he's married to or any kind of mythology in Greek mythology, it's Aphrodite, right? This narrative is, is very famous. And there's also a deep contrast here, right? Because he is an ugly, crippled god. And yeah, Hephaestus is the god of, like, the fire, the forge, right? So he's like a crippled, hunchbacked blacksmith that lives underground. He's like a troll, essentially. Um, right. And he's married to Aphrodite, who is the very incarnation of sexual pleasure and beauty and all of these things, right? So, correct. A very strong contrast. So I don't, I don't want to get lost in a lot of the details here because we might want to circle back to him, you know, as we um, maybe trying to figure out exactly why does he give us this narrative. But in short, right, Hephaestus is married to Aphrodite. He has to leave on a trip. Ares finds out that he's leaving. And we kind of get that this is, you know, a habitual thing. And so Ares comes into Aphrodite saying, look, Hephaestus is gone. And so, you know, the smith, however, you know, he gets word of this, right? Hephaestus starts to understand that this is happening if he leaves. And so he basically makes a trap is what he makes, right? He makes basically a trap. And so he sets this trap for Ares and Aphrodite. And of course, you know, they fall right into this. They're they're going to make love in this bed, and basically these chains come down. They trap them into this bed, and Hephaestus basically asks and tells the other gods this is happening. And I love this part where it talks about um, you know the gods, the male gods are going to come look and look at this you know display, but the female ones, you know, modesty kept each goddess to her mansion. Modesty is not a trait that I associate with the Greek gods a lot, even the female ones. But I thought it was, you know, an interesting note. So they all come, and here's Aphrodite and Ares caught in their adultery, chained by this net basically to the bed. And they're sitting here like laughing at them. You know, Apollo's there, Hermes is there. Um, and, you know, they're kind of just, uh, Poseidon, I think, steps in to basically, you know, broker a deal uh, to end this. And and then it ends. And I think that a lot of times the reader is like, okay, great. Like, what? why did we just go through this long narrative? And I think on its face, you know, obviously I think when you're reading the Odyssey and you see a narrative about adultery and people getting trapped into it, I think, you know, on its face... I think there's a few stories that immediately come to mind. It's hard not to think of Odysseus and Calypso in this narrative, right? I don't think it's hard to to make that connection. Um, you also run into this when you look at Penelope, right? So here's Ares trying to court Aphrodite, and he does, and Ephesus knows something's going on. And so, like, I think this is, you can connect us to the concern we have, um, you know, with the suitors. I think you can also highly connect it to the narrative of Agamemnon. Right, who comes home and you know he falls into a trap. You've got these kind of narratives of adultery um, that I think we can play with, but is there something else going on in this text that makes it actually very much rooted in book eight? Yeah, I think I think there is. So if you look at uh, back on two sixty, so this is this is in Odysseus's kind of rant after he's thrown the discus and he's proven, you know, that he's can can trounce all of these men in all of their games. He says here at 262, only at sprinting, I'd fear you have me in the dust. I've taken a shameful beating out on heavy seas, no conditioning there on shipboard day by day. My legs have lost their spring. So when we go into immediately after this, when we go into this narrative of Hephaestus the cripple, um, being cuckolded by Ares, the god of war, who is described 
as uh, being like fleet of foot or something like that, like striding Aries, right? Um, I think we're supposed to be very attentive to like Odysseus as being almost identified with Hephaestus in this, in this. And so I think you're correct. I think that this story within the broader narrative of the Odyssey is supposed to remind us of what happens if Odysseus doesn't hurry home. So we as readers know what's going back on at Ithaca. Odysseus, to our knowledge, does not. Odysseus has no idea what's going on. All he knows is that he's been away from home like 18 years. Um, and there's an anxiety there that I think we ought to be clued in on um, because Agamemnon's been brought up all throughout the first four books, four, first, yeah, four, first four books of the Odyssey. Agamemnon, be like Orestes, right, who avenges, right, and stands up for his father. Well, that's there's a, there's a lot of anxiety there. There's a lot of weight there. Odysseus, you need to make it back home because if you don't, you might find out that Penelope hasn't been faithful like you've wanted her to be. Um, or right, like there's this, um, and so I think I think this because swiftness is mentioned a lot through this. There's just a lot of talk of. Here, actually, 350, right? Um, so after Hephaestus catches catches Ares and Aphrodite, uh, kind of in the act, he he's got them all trapped and they're shackled down and they can't leave. He cries out to the gods in around 345, 346, and says, "Father Zeus, look here. The rest of you happy gods who live forever, here is a sight to make you laugh and revolt you too. Just because I'm crippled." Zeus's daughter Aphrodite will always spurn me and love that devastating Ares just because of his striking looks and racer's legs, right? So this this idea of the cripple versus the one who can run. And I think there's a shade of this tension we were talking about before with Achilles and Odysseus. Which of these two things wins? Is it raw kind of athletic prowess and power, or is craft more valuable? And I think this story makes a statement, and I think it actually weighs in on this question: which of these, which of these two, outdoes the others? Well, if you look here at 370, 371. All the gods are laughing with each other. One would glance at his neighbor laughing out. A bad day for adultery. The slow outstrips the swift. Look how limping Hephaestus conquers war, the quickest of all the gods who rule Olympus. Here, the third one, the cripple wins by craft. So these are like little aphorisms that are being sprinkled through here. So... It's interesting because I think at once it speaks to the anxiety that Odysseus should have. And maybe this is what Odysseus is feeling as he's hearing this story. He's like, I need to get home, right? I can't, I can't be slow. I can't afford to be slow in getting home because if I am, things might be, it might be too late when I get back. But I think there's also this element of the cripple winning by craft. It's Odysseus's craftiness, not his haste in getting back home, that will eventually allow him to not only see the day of his homecoming, but hopefully, I think this is foreshadowing, right? Like we will see that Odysseus, even when he gets home and finds that not all is well in Ithaca, maybe his craft will allow him to win even though he wasn't able to win by being there first. Yeah, so we say so if I understand correctly, basically, you know, as I mentioned, you can you can run it parallel with multiple of these kind of adultery stories. It would seem then that Homer's intent, or at least primary intent, is to run it parallel to Penelope and the suitors and Odysseus's return and what he's going to find there. 
Okay, very good. So let's see. We get the story. The bard uh, sings this, and there's parting gifts that are given. We talked about this already. Brodsey has to make his amends, and so he gives a sword to Odysseus to make that amends. Your girl comes back, right? Nausicaa. So this is on 515. He bumps into Nausicaa, and she says, Farewell, my friend. And when you are at home, home in your land, remember me at times. Mainly to me, you owe the gift of life. And let's let's go ahead and add Odysseus' response to this and then kind of discuss it. He says, Nausicaa, daughter of the generous King Alcinius, or Alcinus, may Zeus the Thunderer, Hera's husband, grant it so, that I travel home and see the dawn of my return. That all seems pretty normal to me. The next couplet does not. Even at home, I'll pray to you as a deathless goddess. All my days to come, you saved my life, dear girl. What do you make of this? Yeah, I think this is, um, I think there's something playful that Odysseus is doing here. And and I, so um, I didn't say this explicitly the last, uh, the last couple of times we've, we've talked about Nausicaa, but I really find Nausicaa a charming and very endearing character. And I think here she has such a tender relationship with her father. I think we see that she has won Odysseus's heart in a way because he's very tender with her as well. I think there's um, one element of this that I would draw out. Um, Nausicaa, obviously, I think is here dropping like a reminder like, hey, I'm here. Remember I saved your life. Remember all that we talked about there. Remember all the hints I dropped you. Like she's she's trying to do this. The very same thing that she did with her father, right? Which is trying to communicate something to Odysseus uh, or remind Odysseus of something uh, without explicitly coming out and saying, it. just like she reminded her father, hey, my marriage is coming up. Uh, are you thinking about this? Can I go do my laundry? Like all of this. And then her father kind of responds with this oblique response. I'll never deny you anything, which answers that fear. Right. So I think there's a little bit of rhetoric going here and I don't, I wouldn't claim to understand because of how concise this is. I imagine there has to be some kind of carefully selected words because of how few they are. But he says, even at home, I'll pray to you as a deathless goddess all my days to come. I think what he's doing is he's putting up a barrier between himself and Nausicaa. Like he's letting letting her down gently, essentially. And the reason I say that is recall from the very beginning, who did he address her as? He addressed her as Artemis. Yeah. And so when he says, I'll pray to you as a deathless goddess, I think he's trying to go back to when he first spoke to her and said, I'll pray to you as Artemis. And, you know, again, Artemis being a virgin goddess and a virgin goddess that no man would dare dream to approach sexually. I think he's being very clear, very polite, yet still very clear. I'll pray to you as this virgin goddess. Like this, you are not, you are not going to secure this relationship with me. I think um, now he does also give her this blessing or, or, or invoke the god Zeus, right? Hera's husband. So there's this marital language here. It's like, I think Odysseus is making clear, I wish you the best and I hope you'll find a happy husband. Uh, may Hera grant it to you. But I think um, I think he's very politely rejecting her offer here, uh, but he's still very firmly rejecting it. Yeah, I think the I think the references to Artemis greatly inform this passage, right? Which then, on its face, seems almost impious to the gods, right? Why Why are you saying that you'll pray to her like a goddess? I think it's difficult to unlock what is he trying to say here. And I just looked it up in the Lattimore just to make sure that phrase was the same. And it's essentially the same, right? That I'll pray to you, right? As a goddess. No, I think you're exactly right. I think the Artemis narrative has to inform what he's doing here. And also the statement is just so odd, 
right? It's so unique. It's a unique statement, right? I'll pray to you like a goddess. I don't recall anything in Homer up to this point that has the same rhetorical kind of movement as that. No, I, I think you're correct. I th- I would hesitate to like. I, I would kind of go to bat for Odysseus. I don't think this is. I don't think this is impious. Im- impious, rather. And I think it, it's. It's difficult because. Um, this is kind of like a, maybe a modern example of the question, but if someone says, oh, how are you? And you've just had a terrible day, but you say, I'm fine. How are you? Like, what, what's, are you lying there? Are you being dishonest? No, you're not. You're just returning the greeting kind of thing. And I think like there's this social ritual and what's said is not at all what's like the, the words actually said don't correspond necessarily to the meaning that is given them so when someone says hey how are you they're not actually necessarily interested in how you're doing on a deep emotional level or anything they just are greeting you essentially is how it goes so too i think here odysseus might be absolved from whatever impiety might one might attribute to the words that he says because that's not what's act, what he's actually communicating. Like he's not actually, I don't think either one of them leaves this interaction with the thought that Odysseus is actually going to pray to Nausicaa. Hmm. But I think that he says it to communicate something. Not, and it's not even communicating that this is how I see you. It's like, this is how I'm going to treat this relationship. Um, which I think is a very distant relationship. I think that's a major distinction, right? Because I, I, would, I would make a distinction here that we need to be careful that uh, Odysseus's rhetoric to Nausicaa is not necessarily what his internal uh, or interior disposition is towards her. Because I, I think she kind of haunts, I think she's going to haunt a few other passages in the Odyssey. And so, you know, I, let's, I, I agree with everything that you've said, and I really like the Artemis connection. Uh, I just want to highlight that what you mentioned, which is there is a distinction then between his interior disposition and what's coming out of his mouth. Because we really don't know what he thinks. Well, but I think that's that's kind of the whole point of rhetoric in general, right? Like Nausicaa does it with her father, right? Like she secretly has this thing. I want to know about my marriage and I want to know if, that my dad's thinking about my marriage. But then she doesn't say it. Her words don't match her thoughts. But again, there are times when your words matching your thoughts is inappropriate socially, but it's also sometimes dangerous, like in the case with Calypso. I do think it's interesting that Odysseus says, I'll pray to you like a deathless goddess immediately after the last goddess he encountered. Um, Well, one, he doesn't think Athena has been answering his prayers, which is interesting as we learned uh, a couple of, a couple of chapters ago. Uh, But then also in this case, uh, Calypso is the closest thing to a goddess he's known in his recent memory, and I guarantee you he's not praying to Calypso. Mm-hmm. So, I yeah, I think you're correct. What Odysseus says doesn't always match his intentions, but I think that's just the nature of rhetoric in general. Whether that's dishonest or not, whether that's something Odysseus should be morally blamed for, I think is going to take a lot of careful examination in fu- those future passages. Because sometimes Odysseus's purpose, maybe, right? Like we've seen Odysseus lie once where he says, don't blame, don't find fault with a faultless daughter. It was my idea not to follow Nausicaa into the city. Um, that wasn't true at all. And yet he still said it. Well, why, why does he tell like this obvious lie? Um, I, think, I think we have to really wade through... Um, you know, Odysseus's honesty, dishonesty, uh, holding back key information. Like, this rhetoric is going to layer very quickly in the narratives that proceed uh, from this part. So I think you're right to draw careful attention to this passage, but also flagging it for the future as we hear Odysseus encounter and interact with other people and the words that he uses there, let's be very careful to hear what Odysseus is actually saying, what he might be suggesting subliminally or as a subtext to what he says and the way that he says it. 
and then what Odysseus actually intends or thinks or believes. No, very good. I'm just pointing out, just because he says these things, don't count out Nausicaa. Don't count her out yet. Just, you know, I think he's making it, I think he's doing well. We've been worried about the temptations. He's a much more natural temptation to him than Calypso. He's doing a good job. We're just going to be careful about what his rhetoric is and where his interior disposition is. So, yeah. No, very good. So, Odysseus, <clears throat> let's look at this narrative because I think this is fascinating. So, Odysseus, right, we're back at, we're in a context of a feast. And this is what we kind of talked about earlier. There's some some funny things here where he tells the bard, right, what he wants to hear. And Odysseus has this really high praise for the bard, right? That he respects him more than any man alive, right? Surely the muse has taught you. So here goes into your book eight theory, right? We're at the end of book eight, and here's a praise of the bard, right? Which is just comical because the evening might be drawing to a close. But Odysseus asks him explicitly to sing of the wooden horse that Epius built. And that's the guy that wins the boxing contest. Remember in the Iliad, it's the same guy. The seeing of the wooden horse. So this time what's interesting, and he actually mentions himself, that good Odysseus brought one day to the heights of Troy. So this is really interesting as we've kind of talked about Odysseus and like giving hints of himself and is it slipping up or, you know, what is happening here. Here Odysseus asked the bard. In the last one, the bard just saying about him in Achilles, right? And he found himself in a somewhat difficult situation of having what is a great, you know, emotive story for him being told in his presence and he has to, he quietly weeps. Here, Odysseus requests a certain story from Troy. And I think that's a distinction worth noting. And so we get here, not as much as the myth, but here we do get, <clears throat> excuse me, we do get a little bit of the narrative, right? That Odysseus, like he marched up like a god of war. This is around 580, right? And we're getting a lot of these things saying about Odysseus himself. And Odysseus just melts into tears. And before well, he... he he doesn't just melt into tears. Like I, I want to draw attention to this. Like in five uh, five eighty eight, this simile is very drawn out and it's very graphic. As a woman weeps, her arms flung around her darling husband, a man who fell in battle fighting for town and townsmen, trying to beat the day of doom from home and children. Seeing the man go down, dying, gasping for breath, she clings for dear life, screams and shrills, but the victors just behind her digging spear butts into her back and shoulders drag her off in bondage, yoked to hard labor and pain. So from Odysseus's eyes ran the tears of heartbreak now. So, Eli, tell us why I think this is an incredibly ironic passage. Oh, uh, this is exactly what happened to Troy. So Odysseus is weeping like the women wept at Troy, thanks to his efforts. But yeah. why? So, so let me ask you, why does Homer choose this simile? Well, why does Odysseus weep in such a dramatic and uncontrollable fashion? do you think, for one? Why does Odysseus do it? And two, why do you think Homer uh, purposefully draws this connection into our mind? It's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer that immediately comes to mind. I'm still trying to, you know, I want to connect it to why Odysseus does this to himself. Odysseus requests specifically this uh, passage be sung. And so he he sets himself up for this, right? I guess for like this emotion. And so, I mean, outside of, you know, outside of the fact that I think there's an irony here because, you know, he's the one that basically did this to the women at Troy. And then Homer has this ridic ridiculously long simile that puts him in that context to say how he's uh, weeping. I mean, what, what specifically do you see here that you would say that Homer is trying to, to draw out? I would say I think the most obvious connection is kind of at like 597 or so, uh, or 596. They drag her off in bondage, yoked to hard labor and pain, and the most heartbreaking torment wastes her cheeks. I think if we recall back where Odysseus was in book five, this should sound familiar. So I think... 
I think what is interesting is that Homer makes a parallel between what happened to Odysseus's victims and then what became of Odysseus himself. Namely, he was dragged off into bondage on Calypso's island. Now, it's like, you know, the pleasure island, right, of Calypso, right? Like, it doesn't seem like it should be this terrible place of bondage. And yet for him, where does he spend his days? He's sitting on the beach, bawling his eyes out, cheeks sunken with grief, right? Like, he is just absolutely heartbroken over his turn of fate. What I think is going on for Odysseus is that he is remembering the events that happened, which are probably gruesome and traumatic enough. But I think more than that, he's recognizing how much time he's lost and how much how much glory he is due. Like maybe there's a sense of he feels like he's been robbed because his glory was stolen from him by this bondage that he was kind of put into, this captivity on Calypso's island. He hasn't seen the day of his homecoming. His glory has been unconsummated in a way. Um, and so I feel like, I mean, that's that's the sense that I get from this, that Odysseus is being identified with his own victims precisely because even though he was the victor in some ways he was a victim of his own transgressions uh, in troy which we'll learn more about as he tells the story of his homecoming and so forth so i mean i yeah it's interesting because that segues into a little bit of um and i realize this is a stretch but I tend to read the Iliad very, very strongly with Homer as the teacher. And one of the things that I think that he's teaching us there is what is arete? What is that excellence of being a man, of being a human being? And in that, the, to have that teaching, he contrasts Achilles with Hector, if we've already mentioned, right? And so, you know, we should point out, I think in, in a lot of ways, is that the medieval tradition, how they received this is that Troy were the good guys, right? Those were the good guys. Hector is the first of the nine worthies that we've already discussed on the podcast. Right, and the Trojans so, are fighting a, they're fighting a defensive battle, right? They're not the ones that are, you know, obviously Paris has done what Paris has done, but that doesn't justify the, the onslaught and the absolute raising of Troy that takes place. Right, and we should mention that, that it's from Troy, right? That is the mythical founding of Rome. But the, the, that the Romans are Trojans, right? Through Aeneas, the royal house of Troy survives. And then the Romans, right, are, are their descendants. And then it's from Rome that we get both the empire and the, you know, apostolic church, right? Which then gives this great form to the medieval mind. And so one of the things that I was reading this as, where the woman weeps and et cetera, I mean, very clearly there's the irony there of Odysseus, and this is what he did to others, and now he's weeping like that, you know, whether you want to connect it to Calypso or others. But I also found it to be a very pro-Troy statement from Homer, right? A sympathy for those women and how they suffered. Because if you recall, you know, we did do an episode, as I've already mentioned, on the interim period, and some of those narratives towards the women are brutal. And so, I mean, Hector's wife is known, um, you know, for her, for her virtue. Uh, Hector's mother, if I recall, is is basically known for her insanity and just, you know, snapping. And then basically the, the war's not over until they throw little Lord, what was his name? Um, Astyanax. Yeah, until they throw him off the cliff. And if you pull the, the verses from the plays, that's a heart-wrenching uh, narrative. So part of this here is that I, I think, Homer, I liked your statement of Homer showing the evils of war. I think that somewhat dovetails into my suspicions of him being pro-Troy, which I think that's a that's a heavy statement, being a Greek. I think more being pro-Arete, pro what is human excellence, and that he has some subtle critiques here of what happened at Troy. Was Achilles really the greatest person? Now we have Odysseus, and maybe the same question exists. Maybe so. Maybe so. Okay. I do think—go ahead. 
Oh no, I was gonna I was gonna push us on to kind of to wrap up this book. So if you have something else, let me know. No, that's all. Yeah, I just I did we did skip over we mentioned it kind of, but we did skip over where not only does Odysseus praise the bard, but he also gives him like a wonderful cut of meat, right? These are oh yeah, he gives him the gives him the back straps or the you know the tenderloin. Yeah, so it's like again, like oh you know tip your bards. So anyway, just just a funny, uh, somewhat comical note. And then, yeah, I think we get into the moment that a lot of us have been waiting for is that finally uh, King Alcinous says, Odysseus, basically, who are you? Come tell us the name they call you by there at home and tell me your land, your people, your city, too. <clears throat> and so this yeah, is gonna- even 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 before that, actually, um, he says, don't be crafty now, my friend. Don't hide the truth I'm after. Fair is fair. Speak out. So what is that fair is fair, right? Like that's mm-hmm. the, you have to reciprocate now. We've done all of these things for you. We've given you this hospitality. You have this promise of homecoming. I've offered you my daughter's hand in marriage. Like it's time to tell us who you are. Like, you know, that's the least you can do to reciprocate this. Um, but he does also say, don't be crafty, right? We've seen Al- Alcinous and Odysseus interact, particularly over the question of like, what were you doing with my daughter? That, I mean, Alcinous even says explicitly, you and I think as one. So I think Alcinous has a, a, a craftiness that's able to, to recognize Odysseus's. Um, and he's been like concealing and covering for Odysseus, right? Um, trying to be a good host this whole time. But now he's, he's seen Odysseus drop a hint about his identity He's seen him weeping at the mention of a, the the sacking of Troy. Um, and he's like, who are you? And I think at this point, Alcinous has a very good idea of who he is. Of course, um, yeah. But he, being a good host, has this, hey, why don't you tell us who you are, right? Like, he's being, he's trying to cover for Odysseus, but but also give him the opportunity to, and I think this invitation actually from Alcinous is meant to encourage Odysseus that it is safe for you to do this here. Because if it wasn't, Alcinous probably would not have invited him to give him this who who are you speech. I think he probably would have like found some convenient way to dispatch Odysseus. That's good. Yeah. So then we're getting into I just want to kind of point out again, like, you know, hopefully you've enjoyed reading the Odyssey uh thus far. I think there's lots of layers to it. There's Telemachus, there's Odysseus trying to you know, re- regain his own Thumos as he comes off of Calypso's Island. Book nine, though, is what sold the whole Odyssey for me. So when the first time I read the Iliad, it was book five. Diomedes fights the gods. I just kind of, I was like, okay, I love this book. This is wonderful. Book nine, it took me a little longer to get into the Odyssey, but book nine, I think, is probably one of the most fascinating books in the entire Western canon. It's just, Odysseus and the Cyclops, I think it's it's just an amazing uh, piece of literature and then book 10 uh we have a bunch of island hopping terrible things happen on each island which is always a fun read and we get cersei right this kind of witch this nymph and i think her the book with her is is um incredibly enjoyable as well so as we kind of move into the rest of the odyssey as we move into our year of homer i think there are many many good things ahead so eli i deeply appreciate you joining us today yeah i appreciate it thanks so much All right, everyone, uh, please go visit thegreatbookspodcast.com and we will see you next week.